Hear now the very words of God as they are given to us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from the first chapter, starting in the 76th verse and reading through to the end of the chapter. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. And may the Lord bless this reading of his word to our understanding. Let's ask him to truly bring it alive this morning. Heavenly Father, you know the task that lies before me. I, I can't possibly articulate what's in my heart and in my mind the way that I would like to. So I ask your spirit to be here to take my words, uh, however poor they may be, and to filter, to synthesize them so that they are applied to the ears of those who are here in the way that you want them to be. May they be your words. This is your word that we are expositing. May they be the words that you want me to say, or may I not say them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the Middle Ages, and you all know what the Middle Ages were, and appropriately called the Dark Ages. The Middle Ages was a time of absolute devastation as far as the church was concerned and a bottleneck for redemptive history. And this, of course, was because of the apostasy of the medieval Roman Catholic Church. They had pretty much left reason and scripture and truth behind and fallen into superstition and mysticism and legalism, not just out and out, apostasy. And, and so there was bound to be a break sooner or later. There was bound to be a reaction. And sure enough, that reaction came in the 16th century, partially through the Reformation. But the process actually began a couple of centuries earlier, 14th, 13th centuries. And it began through a process or a sort of a philosophical belief that was known as humanism. Now, it bore, bears no uh, similarities whatsoever to what we call humanism today because it was focused on the humanities and particularly in a reborn interest in the languages that scripture was written in, languages like Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. And once scholars began to read and relearn these languages and then read the original text, they step back and say, wait a minute, this is nothing like what we're being taught at, at, at church. So therefore, the seeds or the foundations of the Reformation were established. So humanism at that time was a good thing. But then when things did blow up in the 16th century, there was a cultural split of massive proportions with the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it took two forms. On the one hand, there was the Reformation, and the Reformation was a return to biblical Christianity, seeking, seeking to find the very roots of what we believed in, Bible, in the Bible rather than in other means. But there was another branch that occurred at the same time that was the absolute opposite extreme. It went in the other direction. The Renaissance was a regained interest in the humanities and art. But at the same time, it was called the Age of Enlightenment. And it was the, the time that humans decided that God was no longer necessary. And that is really when humanism, as we know it today, was established. But what a paradox, and it's the paradox I want to point out. I mean, not even a paradox, a total and complete conflict. Let me read to you a, 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 a definition of humanism you know, from the, from the dictionary. It goes like this. 
Humanism refers to a rationalist system of thought that attaches primary importance to human instead of divine or supernatural matters. Secular humanism goes farther and insists that ethics and morality are possible in the absence of God. And they call that humanism. But that's a joke. That is a farce. Because we're going to go back to the beginning later on. We are made in the image of God. So how is it possible to take a being who is made in the image of God and called a human in that image, remove God from that human and still call that person or that being a human? He's no longer a human. Totally dehumanized. We become humanoids. Because a true human being is a human being that has relationship, reconciliation, has a, the image, the imago Dei, the image of God as something that can be seen in that individual. Remove the imago Dei, remove the image of God, and you are no longer a human. You're subhuman. And that's the reason humanism is so strange, because it exalts a twisted aberration of humanity. It exalts a humanity that's not a humanity at all, but a dehumanized humanity. Now, you ask me, why on earth am I talking about humanism this morning? Because Zechariah is actually going to describe something to us. Zechariah, we, I don't know if you've picked it up as we've gone through this entire prayer, he has really been through the covenantal focus that he has. He has really been taking us through redemptive history. And brothers and sisters, redemptive history is God rehumanizing a dehumanized humanity? Let me repeat that. Redemptive history from Genesis 3.15 on is God rehumanizing a dehumanized humanity. And we are going to see Zechariah turn to the culmination of that. When for the first time since Adam and Eve, a real human being will walk on this earth. Now, as I said, we're, we're just going to kind of focus on his, his song, his prayer, his prophecy this morning. I'm not even going to go back and set the scene. I just kind of kind of want to focus on what he's doing because I want you to remember the, the sort of the path that he's taken us on. He started out the prayer by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of, our, of, of Israel. He didn't put it just like that. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited and redeemed His people. He talks about God visiting. He uses covenantal language. He talks about the redemption of God. That's, re that's redemptive history. And then he explains how that's going to happen by talking about the horn of salvation that He has raised up. Of course, we've talked about that. We know that horn of salvation is Jesus, the power power that he has to save. Well, th then he launched into an even deeper discussion of the covenants. First of all, he talks about David and how this, this Messiah who is going to come is going to fulfill the covenant that God made with David. It was a covenant of the king and a covenant of the kingdom. The kingdom is going to be established and the king is going to reign. Well, that king is Jesus. And, and then last week we talked about that Abrahamic covenant. And how glorious it was because we've got a real problem. And we've already talked about it a little bit. We're going to talk about it more. Because we've got a holy God who can't bear to look upon iniquity. And we have at the same time a sinful humanity. How on earth are they going to be reconciled with each other? Well, we found out in the Abrahamic covenant. Because God made a covenant with Abraham and sealed it in blood. But God walked through the pieces of bloody carcass himself twice as that as that burning fire pot and that flaming torch saying, I, I am the one who will bring you righteousness. Abraham's asleep. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It lays the groundwork, sets the scene. So we have two covenants already spoken of and now he's going to turn his focus to the third covenant, the consummation, the consummating of all that, bringing everything together in redemptive history because that is exactly what happens in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to bring that out as we make our way through the text. 
Well, anyway, let's turn to that 76th verse. We're going to see that slightly he's going to change his focus now. He's going to talk about his son for the first time, really, in this prayer. So look at the 76th verse. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Now, let's just talk about that. Notice the tenderness with which he talks to his son. He turns that focus and says, but you child. There's a very tender feeling to that, almost as if he's cradling that eight-day-old boy just circumcised in his arms. But isn't it remarkable that this entire song, I mean, obviously the occasion is the circumcision of John the Baptist, and the whole place is full of people, and his song of exaltation and thanksgiving barely mentions the boy. It's all about God and his covenantal faithfulness and the Messiah that he is sending. And his focus on John the Baptist, his son, seems to be entirely centered around his place in redemptive history. In other words, this whole psalm has been about redemptive history and now to the culmination of that and his son John's place in that history. You, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. Well, the reason that he knows he's going to be a prophet, first of all, he's under the direction of the Holy Spirit. But if you remember, the angel Gabriel told him as much earlier. He says that he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Well, Elijah, of course, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. So it was clear that he was going to be a prophet. But notice what he says. You will be a prophet of the Most High. Now, we've already talked about that. If you were here during the time we talked about Mary's song, the Magnificat, when the angel said, well, actually, it was before the Magnificat. It was when the angel was telling her that she was going to have a son, even though she'd never known a man. And he said, he is going to be the son of God Most High. And we talked about that word. That It's not the Greek word, but the Hebrew word that that refers to is El Elyon. And it's the, the Hebrew name for God that talks about the supreme God, the God above all other gods, the God in his absolute, utter transcendence, that majestic God. You will be the son of the Most High. Well, now Zechariah says his son, you will be the prophet of El Elyon. And I see in that a connection between the two. Because obviously, Zechariah has no idea, I wouldn't think he had any idea, that his son was going to be the last Old Testament prophet. But the focus of this prophecy is going to be Jesus. He's going to be the one who comes after him, the one who sandals he's not worthy to untie. His prophecy, his ministry is going to be focused as the herald of the Son of God. Now, the angel had some profound words to tell um, Zechariah about that. And, and, and he, 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 I'm not going to say that Gabriel was a prophet, really. I don't see how you could say that he was prophetic, because after all, he's just a messenger from God, and God doesn't prophesy. He just knows everything. Um, but he is foretelling what's going to be with his son and to put him in his place of redemptive history. Here's what the angel says. He says that he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Well, many of you know, those are, that, that's a direct reference to the last two verses of Malachi. The last of the Old Testament was Malachi, 400 years before this. And the last two verses speak of the coming of Elijah. Now, tragically, most Jewish people didn't accept this. And as you know, many Orthodox Jewish families still leave that empty chair at Passover waiting for Elijah to come back. But we know because Jesus told us that John the Baptist is the Elijah to come. He is the one that Malachi spoke of. And that's exactly what the angel is telling us here. He is virtually quoting Malachi. Earlier we read also of the prophetic 
um, establishment, and, 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 and Zechariah makes a reference to it, that Isaiah said about this boy. Isaiah said, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Well, Zechariah knows that that's his son. Can you imagine the joy if you were a member of the Messianic community at that time like Zechariah and Elizabeth were? If you had been waiting all your life, I mean, he is thrilled to have a son, don't get me wrong, but he's been really waiting for the Messiah. And now he knows that his son is the harbinger. He's the one who's going to set the entire culmination of redemptive history in motion. That's why the angel said, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. They're rejoicing because redemptive history is coming to its climax, its culmination in the child who occupies Mary's womb. And so the point so far is that Zechariah, I think, is fully aware of his son's place in redemptive history. And so after he establishes the prophetic aspect of it, now he's going to go in and get more specific about what that function is going to be. Look at the 77th verse. To give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. John the Baptist, as you know, and we'll talk about him later, John the Baptist has a hugely important place in redemptive history, and Zechariah expresses it here. Because he was the one who came before the Lord to prepare the hearts of the people for forgiveness. Remember, his baptism was a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And when John the Baptist came, he began to teach us what was important in our hearts in order to be able to accept the mercy and grace that the Messiah was bringing. And that, of course, was his message. Matthew 3 tells us that John the Baptist came preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So vital, so important, so central to the message and the, and, and the purpose and the mission of Jesus Christ. That was what he started teaching and preaching in Matthew 4. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is upon you. In other words, John knew that Jesus was the Savior. Remember, he sees him at the baptism in, John, um, in the book of John and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew who Jesus was right off the bat. So he realizes that Jesus is the sacrifice for sins. But at the same time, he also realizes that, he is, um, that there's a process that leads up to that forgiveness. And it's repentance. Brothers and sisters, it is no less important now, today, that you understand the function of John the Baptist as it was then. Because repentance precedes forgiveness. Forgiveness precedes salvation. Salvation precedes glorification. So in other words... You've heard me say this before, that I feel that repentance is a necessary, a vital part of salvation, and that if you've never repented of your sins, you're probably not saved. And I know that's a harsh statement to say. But you see, there must be a conviction of sin, and that's what John the Baptist came to establish, so that people would understand and have a conviction that they cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. We've talked about that. God is holy. He cannot bear to look upon iniquity. We're covered with it. So therefore, there's no chance that we could ever have a relationship with God. We're absolutely sunk as far as that is concerned. And so therefore, there must be a change. There must be some way that we are forgiven and made righteous so that we can stand in the presence of God. And so we desperately need 
a savior. We desperately need someone to save us. We cannot save ourselves. We can never ascend to the perfection that God requires. So therefore, we have to have a savior. And if you are not convicted of your sin, how do you know that you need a savior? You're going to save yourself. You're a good person. Now, I'd realize that I am speaking heresy as far as our culture is concerned. Because our culture teaches that you're good. You're basically a good person. You just need to get better. You know, I'm okay. You're okay. We just, we just need to improve ourselves and we're all going to get along just fine. That's not biblical and that's not scriptural. And if that's the way you feel, you don't need a savior. And if you don't need a savior, how can you be saved? I don't care how many times you walk down an aisle or how many times you say a sinner's prayer. If you are not convicted of your own sinfulness and know that those sins will indeed condemn you, then you don't need a Savior. And if you don't need a Savior, you're not saved. And that's what John the Baptist taught us. That's what the knowledge of salvation is. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is upon you. So it is wrapped up in that that Zechariah is now stating. Now, Zechariah is an evangelist, okay? And, and, and let me explain why I would say that. A good evangelist is always going to talk about the bad news before the good, okay? In, in other words, if you really want to share the gospel, don't start out talking about how much Jesus loves you. And, and don't talk about, you know, how he's got a plan for your life. And don't talk about how everything is great and all you have to do is say your prayer and you're saved forever. Okay, all of that is an essential part of evangelism. But again, unless you know the bad news first, unless you are aware of your sinfulness, convicted of that sin, and know that you can't save yourself, then you're not going to have the need for a Savior. So a good evangelist is going to tell you the bad news, like my son is coming to teach you the knowledge of salvation that you need to repent and then he's going to tell you the good news. And that starts in the 78th verse. Verses 78 and 79 are two of the most beautiful, poetic, glorious verses that you're, well, certainly in this prayer, if, if not in, in Scripture. I know you hear me say that every other week, but truly these are beautiful. So let me read you both of these verses together, and then we'll go back and take them apart. Because of the tender mercy of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. He starts out with those words, tender mercy. He speaks of God as being merciful. And since we're talking poetry here, let, let me read you the words of a true, a, a man who had such an amazing grasp on the English language and just had a way of putting things. Charles Spurgeon, he puts it this way. I see in them, that's the words, tender mercy, a soft radiance as of those matchless pearls whereof the gates of heaven are made. There is an exceeding melody to my ear as well as to my heart in the word tender. Mercy is music and tender mercy is the most exquisite form of it especially to a broken heart. To one who is despondent and despairing, this word is life from the dead. Boy, he did have a way with words. But when I read that, both the 78th and the 79th verses, did that ring a bell with anyone? Did, did you see a parallel anywhere? When Zechariah begins to speak of the tender mercies of our God and how the sunrise is going to visit us from on high for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Zechariah just shared the gospel with you folks in a beautiful way. Because he's telling you of the sunrise. He's telling you of the day spring. He's telling you of the light that pierces the darkness. And it is because of the tender mercy, that tender mercy that is the mercy of our gods. Now, I'm tempted, as Spurgeon did in this passage, he just focused on those two words, tender mercy. 
But I want to kind of stay on task because what I want to point out here, and, and, and we could spend the rest of the day talking about the mercy of God. But I, I, want, I wanted you to see a divine balance in God in the way that he is presented. I'm not even sure that balance is the right word. It's more of a wholeness, of a fullness of God. Where we see God not only as holy, but as merciful. We've talked about that this morning. We sang two songs. One, holy, holy, holy. The other one, mercy, mercy. Okay? And we're singing to the same God. Now, if you've been here over the last couple of months, you know that starting in the Christmas season, we began to talk about the holiness of God. And, and we have focused on that, that God who is incomprehensible, who is unapproachable, who is transcendent above his creation, and that in his holiness is wrathful at our sinfulness. But the reason we've really focused on that is because that's the, that's the underreported message. People talk a lot more about tender mercies and love and compassion of God than they do about his holiness. But I don't want us to get a lopsided view of God. Yes, God is infinite in his righteousness and holiness. But he is also infinite in his mercy. He is infinite in his compassion. And he is infinite in his tenderness. So he is a God of tender mercies, but we're seeing both sides of him. We are seeing a God who is perfectly holy, and we are seeing a God who is also perfectly loving. And here we are in the middle of it. Now, how are we going to reconcile the love of God and the holiness of God? Because we're fallen in our sinfulness, and we cannot have a relationship with him, and we desperately want a relationship with him. Well, of course, it's Jesus Christ who brings the two together. It's Jesus and the sacrifice that he makes on the cross, the culmination of all redemptive history that forms the bridge between the holiness of God and the compassion of God and allows him to remain just because Jesus paid for my sins and for yours if you were his. It, 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 it's not a wink. It's not a cosmic grandfather who looks the other way when you sin and say, oh, well, I love him anyway. It's a God who in his holiness cannot not punish sin. But he did to his own son. And Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness as God passed through the pieces himself. A burning fire pot and a flaming torch. Zechariah is bringing the culmination of those two together. Christ is right in the middle of that. Well, let's go on to the, um, to the end of that verse. Whereby the sun rise shall visit us from on high. Now, we begin to delve into a very familiar scriptural theme. Last week, if you were here, was it last week? Well, sometime in the last couple of weeks, we talked about a phrase out of the Reformation that Martin Luther coined. It was Coram Deo, to live in the presence of God, to be in the presence of God. Well, this morning, another phrase from the Reformation comes to mind because it is kind of the theme that Zechariah is talking about here. And that is the, the, the phrase, post tenebras lux. And some of you know what that means. That's Latin. And it just means after darkness light. And it was actually coined by John Calvin. And what he's talking about is after the years, the centuries of spiritual darkness through the Middle Ages, through the Dark Ages, all of a sudden light permeates the darkness in the form of the Reformation. Well, Zechariah is talking about the same thing, but he's not talking about the Reformation. He's talking about the Incarnation. And he's talking about the darkness and literally living in the shadow of death. That means living spiritually at the gates of hell. Seriously. I mean, that's, that's what it means to live in the shadow of death. Because you are right smack outside of the gates of hell. Destined to go there. And so that's the state of humanity when the light pierces the darkness. Now, this is a great theme. 
We talked about it earlier. Remember when I read the moment in the word, Isaiah once again, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The, the light is going to permeate the darkness. Matthew, once again, quoting Isaiah in his fourth chapter. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light is dawned. That's almost word for word what Zechariah just said. The same exact concept. Those who are condemned and literally at the gates of hell, upon them a light has shined. Of course, those of you who are part of our study of John know that this is one of John's major themes throughout his book. Right at the beginning in the prologue, he says this, In him, meaning Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This is what Zechariah is talking about. And by the way, John the Apostle puts this into the perspective of John the Baptist when he says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So Zechariah is hitting upon a well-developed biblical theme that has to do with God's plan of redemption, and that is post tenebras lux. Light pierces the darkness and shines upon those who are condemned, who are waiting at the very gates of hell. But I want you to notice the way that Zechariah words this, okay? Notice the way he words it when he says, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. The sunrise will visit us from on high. Where do you see a sunrise? When you see a sunrise, when you're looking at a sunrise, where is it? Is it on high? No, it's, it's there, horizontal. It's, it, it's, it's on the horizon. As the earth turns towards the sun, that's where the sunrise is. But not this sunrise. This sunrise comes from on high. This sunrise comes from heaven. This is a different kind of sunrise, a sunrise that explodes upon a darkened and desperate world. Did you catch the word visit? Interesting way for Zechariah to put it, isn't it? A sunrise visits us. And once again, I've told you four sermons now that this has come up. Somebody needs to hear this. Okay? When God visits a people. Zechariah said it in the early first part of the first verse of this, that he visits and redeems his people. When God visits the people, when Jesus rides into town on a donkey, when the, 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 the horn of salvation comes upon a people, when he comes into the presence of this group of people, it is either a good thing or it is a bad thing. It's a double-edged sword and there is a razor's edge between it. For those who believe, those who who obey those who subjugate, those who accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's the greatest thing that could ever happen because it is redemption. It is salvation. It is eternal life. It is forgiveness. It is all the things that we want, but it is all focused on how you receive the visitation of the one who comes in this burst of light that comes in those who reject him, those who disobey, those who despise the light, those who want to destroy the light because they love the darkness, caught on the wrong side of that sword for them. It is condemnation, damnation. Jesus himself said this when he said in the third chapter of John, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Jesus is talking about a double-edged sword, a razor's blade. There's no gray in between that. You're on one side of that blade or you're on the other side. Eternity hangs in the balance. 
Well, he says there's this burst of sun that comes from on high, talking about Christ coming into a darkened world. And then look what he says at the end of that, or the uh, 79th verse. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To give light, to shine the life. light. That word um, is the root of a word that we use quite a bit. You'll probably recognize it even though it's from the Greek. Epiphany, that shining. We talked about an epiphany, right? You know what an epiphany is? It's when you have, to put it in colloquial language, an aha moment, all right? Oh, wow, I just realized something. And sometimes that epiphany is divinely oriented. It's the Lord speaking to people in, in the, the, the days of the apostles. There was epiphanies that they would have. And we even speak today of epiphanies when we come to the realization. But when it's used in this context, it talks about the way that the sun comes upon those who are in darkness, who are literally at the gates of hell. It's, it, it, and, and the best way to describe it is an old English word that we don't, we don't use much anymore. And that's the word day spring. And, and a day spring is that exact moment when the sun makes its presence. I can remember when we were in Israel, up early in the morning, looking to the east. We were on the west side of the Sea of Galilee at that time up a little bit in a tall building and watching the sunrise come up. And, you know, if you're, if you're a sunrise watcher, you know that it seems like it's going to take forever, doesn't it? I mean, just a little bit of light comes and then it grows stronger and stronger and then all of a sudden, pow, the sun bursts above the horizon and seems to spring into the day, okay? That's the way Zechariah is describing the way that the sun has come upon those who are lost in darkness at the very gates of hell. The day spring has occurred and we have seen his glory. The glory as of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. The word has become flesh. And that's what he's saying. And then he ends it with this Beautiful, beautiful statement. To guide our feet into the way of peace. He gives both the purpose and the destination. And brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I almost get overwhelmed because it becomes extremely personal to me. And, and actually, this is where Zechariah brings everything together. It's real personal to me because, you see, I was one of those guys at the gates of hell with ev I deserve to go in, I deserve to die and roll into those gates and spend my eternity in hell because I was not concerned with God at all. I wasn't paying him any attention. I wasn't uh, honoring him. I, I was defiling him in everything that I did and said and thought. And so I should have been absolutely lost. But the king, the day spring came and he entered the darkness and he took me by the hand and he led me out of the darkness. He, he, he led me to the place that he was. He led me to a, a place where I didn't deserve. He led me to peace. And, and you, you, you hopefully know by now that when we say peace in a biblical context, we're not talking about absence of conflict. We're not talking about health or wealth or a life of ease. We're talking about shalom. We're talking about peace with God. Because you're at enmity with God in your, fallen, in your fallen state. And he comes into the darkness and takes us by the hand, leads us into the light so that we might have reconciliation and peace with God. How on earth does that happen? Because you see, I'm still in that cesspool. I'm still in the sewer. I am still a rotten, wretched, twisted aberration of what it means to be a human being because I don't represent or reflect the image of God at all. So how on earth am I going to have peace with God? There's only one way. Righteousness. Perfect righteousness is the only way that any of us will ever stand in the presence of God. Let me repeat that. Perfect 
righteousness is the only way that any of us will ever stand in the presence of God. How on earth does a person like me, a drunk for 20 years, get perfect righteousness? Never is the answer. I will never find righteousness on my own. You see, precisely here is where Zechariah is bringing everything together. We're lost in darkness. And we're bound by the slavery to sin and the master of this world. But the king of kings comes and he brings his kingdom to earth. And the king comes into the darkness and he finds us and he takes us out of that darkness. That's the Davidic covenant in a nutshell. But then he makes us righteous. And Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as what? Righteousness. Was it his righteousness? Did he grow righteous all of a sudden? No, it was God's righteousness because God is the one walking through those pieces, both as the smoking fire pot and as the burning torch. It is God who redeems us and it is God's righteousness that brings the Abrahamic covenant together. And how is all this brought to us? The Christological covenant. Jesus the Christ is the king and the redemption At the end of those bloody carcasses is the cross of Jesus Christ. He takes us by the hand, guides us out of darkness, and guides us into peace with God. That, brothers and sisters, is the culmination of redemptive history. That is what redemptive history has all been about. God bringing a fallen relationship or or, or humanity back into relationship with him. And put it another way, God rehumanizing a dehumanized humanity. Well, I have a few more words to say about that, but first of all, let's finish up our text because that's it for Zechariah. That's the end of his beautiful, beautiful song. Can you imagine the beauty that we have seen in this first chapter of Luke? These two songs, the Magnificat and this Benedictus, I mean, just absolutely gorgeous. But Luke steps in and tells us just a wee bit about John the Baptist. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. We don't learn much about John the Baptist. We would expect that he would live a righteous life, not perfect righteousness in the sense of justification, but a good life because, after all, we know that he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, as the angel told Zechariah. We've already seen him leap for joy in the presence of the Messiah at the stimulus of the Holy Spirit. So we would imagine that he lives a godly life What we might not have expected, if it weren't for the prophecies, we might not have expected him to end up as an ascetic in the desert. And and we can only guess at why he did that. Probably because when you you live a godly life and you're surrounded by wickedness, it's, it's hard to live in the midst of that. And so he probably moved out to the desert just so he could be, because the desert was a place that people went to find God. And so we see that um, the end of that. Let me see if I can bring all this together for you real quick. I actually was struggling with this a little bit. Um, how, uh, how do you interpret this? And then I was driving to church the other day, and um, I heard on the radio a man named Michael Reeves. Some of you might know Dr. Reeves. He's an English scholar and um, theologian, and he had just the most brilliant discussion that was going on on the radio. I was just like, I was thrilled. But not only was it something new for me, an epiphany, if you will, but, but it was also the perfect illustration for exactly what Zechariah is doing here, how he is bringing um, this redemptive history um, throughout the ages. So I want to adapt a little bit of what Dr. Reeve said. Um, I, 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 I'll tell you right off the bat that I, I wouldn't blame this entire uh, uh, situation on him because he was very articulate and I'll probably stumble around, but I did get the idea credit where credit is due. Let me see if I can explain what I'm talking about. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of the creation because that's where we 
kind of need to start with things like this. And remember how God made us. Remember how God made Adam and Eve. We read this in Genesis. If I can find it. Ah, So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Hugely emphasized fact there that God made humanity in his image. That's the reason that I just disagree with Christian evolutionists that say that we developed over a period of time. No, we're made in God's image. That is completely unique. There is no creature, no being on the face of this planet that is made in the image of God. And that defined us, brothers and sisters, that is what made us human. A real human being is a human being made in the image of God that reflects that image. When when Adam and Eve were in the garden, you could look at them and you could say, there are two human beings, complete and total human beings, because the image of God just drips off of them. At that time, they had not fallen into sin. But you know what happens, of course. That when the devil tempts them, they fall into sin. And immediately, there is a dramatic change in creation. Not only does a veil go up between God and our first parents. Not only does sin separate them from that relationship with God. But the imago Dei, the image of God, takes a terrible twist. And literally, they are dehumanized. Now, we still have some semblance of the, of the image of God, but nothing the way it was made to be done in the humans that God created. There's not supposed to be any death. There's not supposed to be any sin. There's perfect righteousness. There's a desire to please God and to follow Him and to love Him and worship Him every minute of every day. All of that was lost. And all of a sudden, we have this dehumanized version of humanity, barely recognizable as that original pair. What's worse is that after a while, humanity began to look at each other in their dehumanized, partial humanoid state and say, that must be what it is to be a human. You see, this is where humanism steps in, especially secular humanism. Looking at a fallen, dehumanized humanity and saying, well, this is humanity. And so they take an idolized view of humanity. They say, we're good people and we're getting better. Really? Look around you at the world. It's fallen to pieces. Evil is everywhere. This is not a humanity getting better. This is wickedness and a twisted aberration of what we were made to be. We're dehumanized. No longer even human. And that, brothers and sisters, is the state that we are in when Zechariah sings a song. We are in that darkness not even able to remember what humans look like. Michael Reeves used the example. I love it. It, it, it. It's as if there was a portrait of Adam and Eve. And if you could stand before that portrait and look at them, you would never ask the question again, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? You know, that's one of our first questions, right? Whenever we talk about the, the being made in the image of God, people ask me, well, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, I'm not going to explain it this morning, but just the fact that you asked ask that question tells me that you don't have a clue of what it means to be made in the image of God. You've forgotten it. Because the image that once held the beauty of the image of God is now horribly marred and graffitied and split and scratched. And we are such an aberration of what we were made to be. This is wrapped up in what we call the doctrine of original sin. Many people deny that. What reform, re- reformers call total depravity. And I agree with Dr. Sproul and others who say that if you really want to understand Christianity, you you can't even get started unless you start with total depravity, the the depths to which we fell or were dehumanized when our first parents sinned. And you certainly will not be able to understand Reformed theology unless you understand the state that we are in and how desperately we need a Savior. 
So I think probably the best way, I thought about different ways that I might try to put this into the context of redemptive history. Um, let, let me just tell you a parable of sorts. I want you to imagine a massive room, a room that's so big that you can't see the walls like the earth curves in the middle. And so the whole room is dedicated for just one beautiful giant portrait. If you've been in an art museum, you know that a wall is usually covered with all kinds of portraits, but this massive wall that goes on forever has one single giant portrait on it, and it is the portrait of our first parents. And brothers and sisters, if you could stand before that portrait, and if you could look at it the way it originally was, you'd never ask the question again. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Because it would be there. You'd see it. It would be right in front of you. It would simply emanate from that portrait. You would see the first parents and you would see the way they were. And you would recognize that that is what it means to be made in the image of God. But as soon as that portrait was beheld, the lights went out. Imagine Adam and Eve standing in that room looking at a portrait of themselves which they can no longer see. And they desperately try to remember what it looked like. But if they could see it, it would be clouded in darkness. It would be ripped. It would be graffitied. It would be torn. It would be a twisted aberration of what it actually looked like. And so it's probably better that it is completely dark. Then the room starts filling up with people. Over the years, the descendants of Adam and Eve grow and grow and grow, and the room gets fuller and fuller and fuller, and still people have no idea what that image looks like. They, they live in darkness to the point that they actually begin to think that the darkness is light. They begin to herald the darkness as light. And they begin to imagine what the portrait looks like. It looks like me. It looks like you. It looks like the rest of us. And so, therefore, that's what humanity looks like. And if I am made in the image of God, then that's the way God must look, just an exalted version of that. So I'm going to create my own God fashioned after myself. This is idolatry of all kinds. And so the people lost in darkness are waiting at the very gates of hell for God's redemptive plan. And then all of a sudden, the day spring. Then all of a sudden, sunrise comes from on high. Then all of a sudden, the room is flooded with light. And people are taken aback because now they can see the portrait of themselves as they really are. And again, as I told you, it's gnarled and messed up and, and, and split. But there in front of that portrait, of that portrait of fallen people, stands a man that is perfect in his humanity. For the first time since Adam and Eve fell, a human being has entered space and time. The word became flesh, and he tabernacled amongst us. And there he stands in front of that portrait, and for the first time you can look upon him and you can see what a real, true, full human looks like. Because he is the image of God. He is the very image of the invisible God. He is the radiance of God's glory. He is the one in whom the fullness of the deity was pleased to dwell. He is God in the flesh, but he shows us the redemption that is ours through him because he is the very image of God. A real human being. But you see, this Christ, this Messiah, he didn't come just to be looked at. He didn't come just that we could see, okay, that's the impossible standard where true righteousness is. That's the impossible standard of what it means to be a human being. No, he came to guide us out of darkness into peace. Paul puts it this way. He says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we also bear the image of the man of heaven. 
See, brothers and sisters, when we think about Jesus, this is natural and it's good. But when we think about Jesus, almost all of us think soteriologically. And you do that even if you don't know what that word means. Okay, we think about him in the context of salvation. Jesus came to be my savior. Jesus came to save me. He came to die on the cross and be raised from the dead so that I can go to heaven. This is the way we look at Jesus. And we don't realize that there's more to it than that. Jesus came to rehumanize a dehumanized humanity. Jesus came to rehumanize us, to restore the image of God, to give us his righteousness. Now, our flesh is going to be in a constant fight with that righteousness throughout this life, but there will be a time when we are glorified. And finally, when we stand before God with our harps and our palm branches, we will finally be human, fully, completely restored, rehumanized humans. So don't let anyone tell you that the religion of this day is secular humanism. It's a joke. It's a farce. You cannot be a human without Christ in your life because only Christ is the one who restores you to what a true human is. So I leave you with this quest, brothers and sisters. A couple of Sundays ago on Easter, we stood out underneath that overhang. And I told you what I felt was the calling for this church to seek Jesus, to seek Him, seek Him, seek Him. And so this morning I give you the same, the same statement. Seek Him. Seek the Lord. Seek Him while He can be found. Seventeen times the Old Testament says, if you seek for me with your whole heart, you will find me. Seek Him in everything that you do. Gaze upon Him because He's the perfect human. He's also God, but He's also human. He's the perfect image of God. Gaze upon Him. And if you gaze upon Him and follow Him and imitate Him and model yourself after Him, then as you grow in sanctification and grace, you will become increasingly more and more every day human. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, boy, do we have it wrong living here in the darkness, thinking that the darkness is light, looking at ourselves in the mirror and looking at each other in this twisted aberration of what a human being was designed to be and thinking that's human. Believing in the exaltation of a human being against you and above you and thinking that's humanism. No, it's not. It's a joke. It's a sad joke, but it's a joke. It's, it's completely wrong. We can't be human without you. We can't be human without Christ. We must be restored to our humanity. And the only way that that can happen is through the righteousness of Christ. Lord, I just pray. I know that I've talked around and through and above and below this subject. It's not an easy one. I just pray that those who have listened will get the basic meaning and the basic understanding of the whole thing. Without you, we are lost. Without Christ, we're lost. Only through him. Can we be restored to being truly human? In Christ's name we pray, amen.